God of wind and flame, send your life-giving spirit upon your people. Give fire to our words, strength to our witness, and boldness to our proclamation of your wondrous work in Christ, who with you and the spirit lives and reigns now and forever. Amen. It is good to be with you today, and uh, thank you, Suzanne, thank you, Kim, for this uh, wonderful invitation. Um, I join you from the ancestral, cultural, and traditional lands of the coastal Miwok peoples, and I'm two miles south of the ancient settlement of Olumpali, which was originally settled 6,000 years ago, or I'm sorry, it was settled in 6,000 BC, so um, a little more than 8,000 years ago, um, in what is now referred to as the San Francisco Bay Area in California. As you know, the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church of Canada are sister provinces in the Anglican Communion, and we share so much more than a long and hopefully temporarily impassable border. Actually, um, to say that points to the sin of arrogance on my part, something Episcopalians in the United States uh, frequently get the opportunity to make confession for when we talk about the Episcopal Church as if it's a United States-based church, because that simply is not true. We have dioceses in Puerto Rico, Ecuador, Colombia, the Dominican Republic, Honduras, Venezuela, Taiwan, Haiti, Micronesia, Cuba, and across Europe. Here in California, we arrogantly claim that the Book of Common Prayer was first cracked open in what some called the New World by the privateer and slave trader, Francis Drake, in 1579. And of course, in doing so, we overlooked the fact that the first celebration of the Holy Communion in North America was most likely at Frobisher Bay one year earlier. Now the Episcopal Church is coming to terms with our own complicity in the forced assimilation of indigenous youth in boarding schools. After reading a news report about the evidence of my church's part in removing native children to go government and church run boarding schools, I told someone in my congregation about that. And he said, oh, that happened in Canada, not here. Later that day, I forwarded the news story to him. And here we are on the eve of Hiroshima Day, the ultimate sign of US arrogance and sinfulness. In the United States, we seem to find it easy to look past the more than 100 to 200,000 dead of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the same way that we simply look at the number of COVID deaths as nothing more than metrics, numbers clicking by. We, your neighbors, have much for which to repent. So I guess I want to reflect a bit on arrogance and self-centeredness, yes. But what I really want to meditate on is justice. Now, um, I'm aware of the fact that we're beginning our reading of Isaiah in the second chapter, and we get to look at Isaiah's, Isaiah's glorious vision of divine justice but we're looking past the reason for this vision. The first chapter of Isaiah is not pretty. Isaiah is addressing in the cha first chapter what he calls, quote, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evil doers. And what is their sin? Well, greatest of all, they do not defend orphans or plead for the widow. In other words, Isaiah's audience are blind to the most vulnerable in their midst. Isaiah is exhorting God's people to cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, and correct oppression. It is only when they do this that we get this vision of divine justice in the second chapter where swords are beat into plowshares and nations learn war no more. So please pardon this bit of an aside, but there's something that strikes me in this vision. There is something reminiscent of the vision we see in Matthew 25, the scripture that Episcopal Relief and Development takes our mandate from. In Matthew 25, the story that many of us refer to as the story of the sheep and the goats is a vision of Jesus' return to judge, quote, all of the nations. 
the reference of the nations in the Greek ta ethne usually refers to those who are not descendants of the house of Judah. It refers to everyone else. In the second chapter of Isaiah, we read that, quote, the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. The Hebrew word for the nations here is goy. You might have heard that used as a pejorative referring to non-Jews, but it really is benign in how it's used in Isaiah and elsewhere in Hebrew scriptures as referring to everyone else. Now, here in today's reading, we have a vision of God's justice as a magnet, as an attractant for all those who are not us. They flow like a river in the Hebrew. It's beautiful poetry here, but they are flowing in reverse. They are flowing towards the highest place because that is the strength of holy justice. When the people see this divine justice, they can't help but be drawn to it. In Matthew, I love how those who are from the nations, who probably don't even know Jesus, those who Jesus recognizes as righteous and separated out like sheep from goats, those people are surprised that they are recognized in this way. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or sick or naked or in prison? It was then, it was when they acted justly on behalf of the most vulnerable. Back to Isaiah, the Goy say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that we may, that he may teach us his ways, and we may walk in his paths. So how is this going for your church community? Are people outside the church witnessing your justice and flowing to you? In the United States-based portions of the Episcopal Church, pandemic trends seem to moving, be moving slightly upward. And for the Episcopal Church and those we call the mainline religions, um, our Methodist, Lutheran, and Presbyterian siblings, um, we're all kind of experiencing this little bump up, but no one knows how long that will last and whether or not that is because of much of our worship now has been available to people from home in their pajamas, coffee and newspaper in hand, slippers on. It has hardly been like all of the nations flowing to us. Why not? Is it our arrogance? Our hubris? Maybe, but honestly, I think we are all simply tired and have given up on God's call. It is not easy to love our neighbor. And over the last several years in the United States, we're finding it very difficult to love one another. Now, where I live, the vaccinated have the luxury of looking at the unvaccinated as the goy in the pejorative sense. While we forget that there are still a majority of, this, of those in the world who do not yet have access to vaccines, um, the vaccinated here are blaming the unvaccinated on variants that are now among us. According to Oxford University's Our World in Data, as of today, 1.1% of people in lower income countries have received one dose of the vaccine. At the, same time, at the same time, people where I live are now trying to figure out when they should get their booster shots. In Canada, you're actually doing better than almost every other country with 60% of your populace fully vaccinated. Only Iceland and the United Arab Emirates are doing better. In the US, we're 49% fully vaccinated. Remember those other countries that I mentioned before where the Episcopal Church has a presence? Well, in the Dominican Republic, 39% are fully vaccinated, while in Haiti, on the same island, 0.07% are considered partially vaccinated. And the number for those fully vaccinated is so small, it cannot register. It shows as 0.00%. Of course, those numbers might have something to do with a population that has very little faith in its government. In Colombia, about 25% are fully vaccinated. In Cuba, it's 24. In Ecuador, 14%. In Venezuela, 3.9%. And in Honduras, 3.18%. 
So it is rich to simply blame variants of the virus on the unvaccinated as if the majority of the unvaccinated have a choice at all. It is another thing to do what is good and just, maybe by paying our luxury of vaccine availability forward in the way that PWRDF's Vaccine Equity Fund helps us to do. In fact, PWRDF has focused on COVID difficulties in Haiti by helping a hospital to, to stay open through the pandemic. And you have helped educate Haitian communities about how to protect themselves and their families from the virus. In serving the most vulnerable during the pandemic, PWRDF has provided medical equipment to the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, expanded the capacity of Bangladeshi women to earn an income, supported food relief and crop restoration in Zimbabwe, and through a six to one matching grant by the Canadian government, supported your partners in Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, and Mozambique with vital PPE and sanitation supplies, as well as helped to disseminate quality health information to dispersed communities in those countries. This work may or may not be growing individual congregations in Canada, but it is making divine justice visible to participa participants in all of these programs across the nations. In the organization I work for, Episcopal Relief and Development, I marvel at how those in other countries and across other faiths see the work of our partners. In Liberia, we join our partner, the Episcopal Church of, of Liberia Relief and Development to end gender-based violence. This is work that PWRDF also does in other countries. In rural communities in Liberia, faith leaders are held in high esteem. They act as community leaders, community organizers, teachers, advocates, liaisons with government and other institutions, and they settle disputes. One thing that they were not doing well was making themselves available to women and children who were victims of abuse and violence. Episcopal Relief and Development started training, along with our partner in Liberia, started training Christian faith leaders using Bible study and self-reflection techniques to begin deeply considering their cultural understandings of gender and abuse. In time, these faith leaders started speaking out in their communities to end intimate partner violence and other forms of sexual and gender-based violence. Then victims started coming to their faith leaders to report abuse and to seek services and resources that the church was providing. An interesting thing to me is that these rural communities are both Christian and Muslim. And soon Muslim faith leaders started to ask the Christians how they could provide similar support to women in their communities. Now Episcopal Relief and Development partners with Islamic Relief USA to ensure that Quranic studies are available to Muslim faith leaders and that services and resources are available to all victims. This is divine justice. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that, we may that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in his paths. When Christians and Muslims work together in Liberia to ensure that women in their communities are safe from violence, perhaps that is beating swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. We at Episcopal Relief and Development give thanks to God for the witness of divine justice that our friends at PWRDF make in the world. And we see them as our peers and family in this work. This divine justice, this shared vocation that our two organizations hold, this is the call of Isaiah to do good, to seek justice, and to correct oppression. Now it is our task to shine a light on this work, to tell our neighbors and friends what love can do. It is time to illuminate that holy justice. And what do we need to bring this light? perhaps a divine spark, like the sparks shared by the Surprised by the Spirit initiative of the Anglican Church of Canada. Primate Linda Nichols has invited Anglicans in Canada to reflect on what you have learned through this liminal time that we have been passing through and to listen for what the Spirit is calling us to. 
The prayer I open my remarks with is from that process. Perhaps reading the words on PWRDF's website about the organization's resilience and the resilience of its partners, perhaps learning about those, about how these passionate and committed people follow Isaiah's call to divine justice every single day. Maybe there you will find enough sparks to illuminate the divine light of truth and justice. Then shine that light. Let people know what love can do. Oh, House of Jacob, oh, colleagues from PWRDF, oh, Anglican friends in Canada, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us illuminate for the nations God's divine justice. Let us show what love can do. Then Isaiah's dream, this divine dream can come true. Amen.